Well, welcome to another chatty bench. Uh, this one's a regular bench, largely because the chatty bench, the big bright yellow one that the ABC Council have installed, is busy this morning. We've got a, a young uh, couple of young children and, and, and others, and a lovely big Irish setter, it looks like, and we wouldn't like to disturb them. So we found another bench because we have another. Uh, vol vic uh, somewhere between a victim and a volunteer, we haven't figured out yet, uh, who's going to talk to us on the chatty bench about all sorts of things, mostly about well-being and a little bit about their own story. And no more interesting a person to get involved with today, a well-known footballer, local footballer, national footballer, uh, and, and also uh, might have been well known at one of the uh, slightly larger clubs. Anyway, we'll get the story in a moment or two. Uh, please welcome to the Chatty Bench, Pat McGibbon. So welcome to the Chatty Bench, Pat. Uh, how, how are things with you? Yeah, all good, Donna. Yeah, all's good at the minute. So um, obviously plenty on and, and with, with the work that I'm doing in, in the area of mental health. Um, it's obviously so needed, especially at the moment as, as we move out of, of the COVID pandemic, but obviously with the, the worldwide issues going on as well. It certainly, it certainly is a, a testing time for people, uh, as you mentioned, COVID in particular. That, that, that really hit people hard. Tell me though a little bit about yourself to, to put all in context of what you do around mental health and all sorts of things. Okay, so look, look, I mean, my my background is 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 very varied. Um, you know, I, I started out uh, obviously I'm a, a lurking lad. Um, played football from a very young age. Played sports, whether it was cross country running, whether it was Gaelic football, whether it was soccer. Played played loads of sports, and, and eventually went over and was was very fortunate and privileged to, to play for Manchester United from 1992 to 97. And, and that was straight from here, basically, from from playing for local clubs. Yeah, I was I was a player at Lurgan United, so I went went through the the teams from under eleven right through to under sixteen, and then from under sixteen through to under eighteen. Then I was over at Portadown, where I played within the youth team, the reserve team, and it was on the fringes of the first team. Um, before uh, getting the trial at Manchester United in 1992, and and at that stage, Donna then then moved over um, after a successful trial to to Manchester United for five years. Followed. I I, I made the mistake of saying last week that actually you'd play for Glenavon and, and, and oh my, the heckles went up because of that. Uh, but you, you played for for the rivals. Did you ever play against Glenavon per se? Yeah, look, I mean, it, it, actually in the the youth, in the Harry Cavan Youth Cup final, which we got to the final of, we played Glenavon and, and a very good mate of mine, Jared McMahon, and Jared would uh, played in the Lurgan United teams going through. At, at that age group, or Jared was playing for Glenavon on that particular evening, but um, we ended up, we beat them 2-0, poured down, beat the Glenavon 2-0 on that occasion. Um, and obviously when I moved back to uh, Northern Ireland in 2002, then uh, for, for a couple of years I, I played, both played for Port Down, but also captain Port Down, and uh, we played Glenavon on a, on a fair few occasions. I well, wonder what that was like for you, I mean, born bred in Lurgan, did you feel the competitive side of things in that exchange? Yeah, I mean, I think both both as a player, when, when you're when you're a player, you just you just get on with it, you just do. And, you know, especially as somebody that had played as a professional footballer, both at Manchester United, Wigan Athletic and, and, and a few other clubs for, for short periods, you were in a vol volatile situation. You were on the pitch, and you, you just concentrated on the game. So, really, the the emotional side of things, you have to control that a lot of the time on the on the pitch. Whereas, from a supporter's point of view, it's a it's a, you know definitely that rivalry between Portadown and Glenavon was something that you could feel, but it was something that you had to, to detach your emotions away from. Let me take you back a little bit to those schooling days and growing up in Lurgan. What was Lurgan like as far as you were concerned? Yeah, look, I had a, I had a great, you know, childhood. Um, going through, obviously, at Tannamore School where I started. Um, during that period, it's where I was introduced to sports. So they mainly played Gaelic football. So from, from Primary 5, I was playing within the school team. And then right through to Primary 7, moved on to, to St Paul's. And... 
again, the loads of sport that I actually remember in this particular park. I, I won the Armad Districts cross country um, run in, in first year. And you know, under uh, Paddy McAnallen, Mr. McAnallen was the the uh, teacher who took the cross country running there. So, the very formative years uh, I've really, really enjoyed um, my time, and especially growing up within sport. All my mates, you know, Lawrence Stone, Connor Lavery, I could go through so many. Um, Kevin O'Hagan, Liam Smith, Steve McGee, David McVeigh, uh, so many. We, we, we grew up together and played, whether it was in Alt Hill Park or down at Castors Bay. We just had a, had a really good formative, you know, childhood and going into the teenage years. And I suppose that helped me because we were all, you know, we were all interested in, in football and interested in sport generally. At the same time, though, there was a division. Uh, in, in the town, you would you, I mean, you'd be dishonest to say there wasn't. Yeah, look, I mean, it, 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 it was it was a time where, and I suppose to a certain extent that, that division still is here, which is is very sad to see. I have to say, you know, I mean, I uh, funny, I, I'm I met up at a at a trial match on Monday, um, with. Uh, a friend of ours, a fella, Dean Hawthorne, and Dean played for Lurgan Town, and Dean, that, that was where, that, that was where everything sort of pulled together through sport, and even now we, we would play in, in sort of over 40s games, and we would all be together, and I think that's what sport gave me. It was it was very difficult. If we're sitting here now, you know, you you went up to Lurgan Pool within your teenage years, and um, at times you'd have came through Lurgan Park, and you'd have been worried about coming through Lurgan Park because of that division. And it was perceived at times, but there, there was always it was always very real as well. Um, and I think for myself as a part now, and for those that that really have that, I suppose that power in order to change things that 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 needs to change for the for the younger generation because you know there's so much strength in unity and being there's far more power in in the good of people you know but unfortunately during this time and and even now you know we we, we the, the people see the differences instead of seeing the strengths of what actually binds us together. So, well, let, let's take you to the Manchester United days. Uh, it's such uh, an honour to be to be chosen to be in what effectively was the biggest club, or almost the biggest club in the world at that time, just on the cusp of of getting to their first championship in so many years. So, how did that feel from your point? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I always say this. I went over as as a fresh faced eighteen year old. Who, from from seventeen through eighteen, and and I took a a growth spurt between seventeen and eighteen, which, which made me, I suppose, grow in confidence. And obviously, then by the the, the end of, of 91, 92, I was captain and Port Down Chief team was captain. The the Northern Ireland schools, uh, you know, things had really taken off. And within that, then, you know, I was going over to Manchester United initially on trial. For a week and then I went over for a further three weeks after that three week period then I signed for them in 1992 but from then you know I always say from 92 to 97 I, I, you know I was on the fringes of the first team I'd played a few times I, I, I managed to get sent off and give away a penalty on my debut which wasn't ideal but I always say during that time even 92 93 United won the league for the first time in 25 years and I always said there was a, an absolutely terrific fabric with the club you know the, as well as the first team winning the league the, the reserve team won the league I think three times in the five years that I was there and they hadn't won the league for about 25 years the A team with with obviously your, your Gary Neville's Bill Neville's David Backham's you go through you go through Nicky Butt Paul Scholes that A team obviously were very very successful and then ended up coming into the first team and being you know terrifically successful so it was just a, a really 
brilliant time for the club and, and a really successful time as well. What about things going on with yourself outside the club? What, what was emerging in your life at that time? Yeah, I mean, look, the, the, the first year that I went over to, to Manchester United, obviously you're, you're trying to sell Lynn, even though I was, I suppose, a little bit more mature than, than lads who went over as an apprentice at, at 16. I went over as a first year pro at Finnish BL Aval, so it was, a, I suppose, a little bit more mature, but I was still trying to, to settle in to the club. I was a big at that stage, and then obviously eight months through, then uh, my brother tragically took his own life, so that was a very difficult period, and, and moving, obviously coming back to Lurgan and dealing with, with that, and um, but football was always, you know, as my passion, it was what I wanted to do, so th that stability that Manchester United for those five years, but also even at Wigan Athletic where there was a great fabric, both of those clubs gave me stability within my life and, and at, a, at a really crucial time because, you know, obviously, you know, the, the, the death of your, your brother through suicide is a very challenging time, so the the then you know, have to deal with that. You need that support network around you, and that's what Manchester United give me. Can I tease a little bit more about about your thoughts around that, and and not for one second to invade the privacy of that situation, but how you, if you dealt with it yourself, or or, or what it taught you and what it brought to your life in in later stages. Uh, for example, your 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 uh, engagement very much with mental health and well-being. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing about it is, and, and my, my parents were always great in terms of, you know, saying about education was very important and the football inside of things I loved, but um, within education as well, uh, it was I always knew the importance of, you know, uh, education. So even at Manchester United, I, I, I initially went over in the first year and, and, and did um, some work with, levels in, in maths but it sort of fell away towards me my, my formative years then or, or sorry the, my, my latter years at, at Wigan Athletic I did a physio degree and so I always had that idea of being proactive in terms of once my you know my, my football and career was finishing my issue was when I moved back home um, was my passion for football it wasn't physically you know you were coming to the end of your career and you were then going into part-time football and you had to decide what you you wanted to do as a real job and that that was difficult because at Manchester United it's stability at Wigan Athletic it's stability all of a sudden when I moved back home with Barnett and the, the, the children then there was quite a bit of instability you know at six house moves uh, didn't know what I wanted to do in terms of a career even though I had a, a ready-made job as such with physiotherapy but it just was I wasn't passionate enough about it and it took an awful lot of soul searching and, and instability to then go into the mental health sphere which you know, quite recently I did a mental health and well-being diploma, but I'm now able to link the, the physical to the mental and emotional well-being. So in a roundabout way, as much as it's been a really tough journey since I moved back home in 2002, it's also been a, a, a great learning experience and it has been experience that, is, that has taught me suppose the value of, of mental health and well-being and there is a lot out there that is based on on, on scholarly work but if you have that <clears throat> experiential well the experience itself behind you that gives you a, a deeper depth of understanding would you say not necessary yeah. to be able to teach it but but it is a benefit perhaps yeah I think I think the, the most important thing is that that one of authenticity because really it, I, I, I watch people and, and obviously I do mental health related talks whether it's in, in, in the public domain or whether it's privately and I always say this you know one of, one of my biggest fears was to, to go up and publicly speak you know because uh, but I always said I needed to, to understand what I was speaking about and so when, when it comes to the experience of it I, I always say there's plenty of sales people out there you know but it's okay talking the talk but can you actually walk the walk and that's really 
where, where this has come from. It has taken time, uh, but that's where I suppose the authenticity comes from as well. How does that play out in the real world when you're out and about? That authenticity, is it something you have to wear like a badge or is it something that people recognise or, or how does it play? I, I, I'm not sure. You know, I mean, people talk about charisma, people talk about authenticity, people talk about different things. Really, uh, you know, I was watching uh, a wee video there just before we came to, for this interview about, you know, with, with Roy, Roy Keane and, and, and with Guy Naval and I thought it was brilliant because they were just having a chat and with that whole thing surrounding authenticity and 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 how do you know i think that certainly from my point of view eventually you just know <laughs> um, but you know and, and i see plenty of people out there that that will are trying almost too hard i'm at a stage now where i don't need to try too hard if, if people like what i do if people you know appreciate it and when it comes to the mental health sphere if people if it makes somebody get a wee spark or you know moment in which they, they reevaluate then whether I know about it or not is is unimportant but if they get that then I will have done some some good and and that's me early so I, I recognize that from from my own point of view the authenticity of of having gone through a break you know, through for example where I, I'm not fearful about talking about the fact it's, it's the easiest thing to do and that in my experience liberates others to talk about it and liberates the idea oh somebody's talking about something we shouldn't be talking about and the fact that you're out there promoting in itself gives that authenticity sure mm -hmm. yeah very, very much so and, and uh, i was up quite recently doing a talk and, and the charity i find it trained to be smart as it has this um, logo it's smart to talk and the smart stands for sharing my anxieties relief tension so I think it's a really, really strong, powerful message. And I was up quite recently speaking with committee members and, and adults in, in regard to mental health. And there was only a very small group. And as I said, you know, whether there's one person there or whether there's, you know, 600, which so was at the, the, the Roy Keane fundraiser in 2016, if one person gets it, then we are doing some good within the area of mental health, Anna, and that's, I suppose, the, that's the most important thing to, to take from it. Because sometimes we will know that we have, you know, we, we have did good, whether that's, you know, with somebody else talking about it to us, or, but sometimes we, we won't necessarily know that, that we have unstuck the stock with people. But, you know, every time you go out, if there's one person there that gets it, then we've done some good. You're working mostly in the, in the, in the uh, area of, of young people uh, in sport. The whole idea of depression, of anxiety and whatever exists all through society, all ages, all shapes and sometimes undefinable places. Is that your experience too? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the biggest... I suppose in, in, in the, the mentor support that I do within, you know, whether it's going out to, to larger groups or in small group mentor support, I always say that the most important thing within the area of mental health is, first of all, non-judgmental approach, you know, that, that everybody has their own story within it, so the more non-judgmental you are, you know, the, the, the stronger that connection will be. Also, in terms of trust, you have to trust who you're speaking to within that space um, and <clears throat> not everybody is set out for I suppose mental health related work in terms of mentorship counselling you know but uh, you don't necessarily need to be an expert but you do have to passionately care about making a difference and you know making a positive difference within it so I suppose that's that's that would be my main points within it, you know, that non judgmental approach and, and, and that that area of trust. What do you say to someone who's watching this who's dying to reach out, dying because they're not able to reach out? And I know they're, they're strong words, but sometimes when you're in the middle of that depression and otherwise you're just looking for a straw to play catch on to what do you say to someone in those circumstances someone perhaps even watching now yeah well again it, it goes back to that idea of you know it's smart to talk and um 
as much as we can and, and in, in the area of, of mental health um, it's very important as a mental health and well-being coach which I am to actually uh, observe and to listen they're the, the biggest strengths but to somebody who's actually in a really really bad place you know to actually speak to somebody um, and you know be able to share the, the you know their, their negative feelings or negative thoughts uh, because as I say it's not that we are experts but you know in, in our, even in sharing that experience it will maybe be the first road and first step to, to recover. Behind you there on the bench, if you turn around, I think you spotted this when you mm -hmm. sat down. Yeah. Actually, just, just have a look at what's there. And I just pull this. This was this was just sitting, literally sitting beside you here. So so what actually is that? Um, well, look, I, I obviously noticed it as, as we were walking through. And what it is, is a little crocheted worm. And what it says within that, Donna, is I'm your little worry worm. Keep me close, keep me near. When a worry pops in your head, hold me tight, whisper in my ear. I will take away your worry so you have nothing left to fear. And it says from Facebook group, random acts of crocheted type kindness. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> and we must go searching for them. And that's just been literally sitting on the bench here. Yes. And, and sometimes that's all it takes, just a little nudge or a, a suggestion or, or whatever. Yeah, definitely, and and those are the rather those as I say the random acts of kindness, um, whether it's uh, and, and and I suppose when I speak about you know the area of mental health, I I do think that it has to be relatable to that person, so you have to get to know that person, and and as much as my sphere, I suppose, is sport, is football, and it it has brought me so many great experiences you know to take away the, the fact that i played for manchester united it, 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 it's the experiences of the people that i've met of the places that i've went that it, which you know that, that can never be taken away in, in the area of mental health you know you need it needs to be relatable to that person so sometimes those we ran the max are were the <laughs> we we talk about the the controllables and you know we we all want as human beings to be able to control every aspect of our life it's just human nature but it's whenever there's random acts of, of kindness like this then um th those are the things that that you remember fondly and you will you will keep within that as well so i suppose that's that's what I would take from What plans are afoot uh, as uh, your work continues with the, the coaching side and with the mental health side? What, what's coming up for you in the near future? Look, it's it's very varied. I, I am I'm self employed, so I work for various groups. I, I work with Mindwise within schools, I work with them um, and, and do resilience based programs both within secondary school and I'll be going into primary schools as well. With Train to Be Smart, the, the, the charity work that I do, it, it, it's really, really rewarding because first and foremost, you know, I've met so many great people within, in terms of the volunteers at, at Train to Be Smart who continue to give their time up. I, I work within Inspire and other mental health groups. So it, it's very, very, to be honest, Noisy good work that has to take part in in, uh, in the park is about to take part, so it's maybe a good time for us to, to bring this to a conclusion. Thank you so much for being with us, Pat, and we look forward to hearing more of your projects and, and meeting up again. Okay, thanks for the interview, Donna.